I'm Aaron Porras, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel sends condolences to the victims of this weekend's Barcelona terror attack. Turkey and Iran get a little bit too close for comfort, and Israeli archaeologists discover a major missing piece of European Jewish history. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. The world has witnessed another deadly terror attack, this time in Barcelona, Spain, where a suspect rammed his van into a crowded intersection, killing at least 14 and injuring 130 others. Israeli woman Edna Hajaj was one of the ones that, uh, wounded in the attack. Hajaj was there with her husband, and when the van hit the crowd, she knew immediately that a terror attack had taken place. In the pandemonium that followed, Hajaj's leg became caught, and all the toes on her left foot were broken. She's back in Israel being treated for her injuries now. And Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has extended his condolences to the victims of the terrible attack. Spanish police have made several arrests related to the attack, but a massive manhunt is still underway to capture the prime suspect who drove the van. He escaped into the crowd amidst the chaos that followed, though investigators are also trying to track down an imam who disappeared back in June and may be linked to the plot as well. The Islamic State has claimed credit for the terror attack, but Spanish police seem hesitant to place the blame at the feet of Muslim jihadists. On the contrary, the Muslim community has been peacefully integrated for years in Spanish society, and police are now beginning to suspect that Moroccan radicals may have played a role in instigating this attack. The entire world continues to grieve for the terrible atrocities witnessed over the weekend, an attack that unfortunately feels all too familiar these days. Pues nada, eh, cuando pasó todo estaba, estaba aquí, que tenía un problema con la puerta, lo estaba mirando y de repente pues nada, vi una furgoneta que se aproximaba y que iba a una velocidad que no entendía y que empezaba pues a arrollar a todo el mundo. Entonces todo el mundo empezó a correr de repente, súper rápido, eh, les dije que se refugiaran en la tienda, la gente que estaba herida también cogimos a gente y la pusimos dentro, había muchos niños... Y todo fue horrible. O sea, y bueno, empezamos a tranquilizar a la gente, la gente estaba muy nerviosa, lloraba, tenía ansiedad. Y bueno, fuimos calmando a la gente hasta las 8 o así, que entonces eh, vinier, vino la policía, sacó a toda la gente que teníamos allí. Just a short term ahead of the United States envoy's visit to the Middle East, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Russian President Vladimir Putin are set to have their next meeting in Moscow on Wednesday. This will make the sixth meeting between the two men in just two years, and they're likely to discuss Israel's concerns with the Syrian ceasefire agreement, as well as Iran, Hezbollah, and other related matters. Israeli officials are gearing up to discuss more of the same in the upcoming meeting with the United States envoys Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner, and indeed they've already discussed it in Washington last week when Mossad head Yossi Cohen took a delegation to meet with United States officials. Arab leaders aren't sitting idly by, though, with the foreign ministers of Jordan, Egypt, and the Palestinian Authority meeting on Thursday to coordinate their positions ahead of their own meetings with United States President Trump's team. The result of that meeting was essentially described by Palestinian Foreign Minister Riyad al-Maliki, who said in a joint press conference, quote, the Americans listened to the United Arab position that there will be no peace without the establishment of a Palestinian state within the 1967 borders, end quote. There's just been an extremely rare and potentially game-changing meeting between political rivals Turkey and Iran. This is a major development considering there hasn't been a meeting like this since 1979, meaning a new Middle East partnership may be forming faster than anyone expected. The General Chief of Staff of Iran's military has just visited the Turkish capital, meeting with top Turkish officials as well as President Erdogan himself. While Turkey and Iran have long found themselves wrestling for control over the Middle East, it seems that common mutual interests may finally be warming the two up, namely in their desire to see Israel fall. They don't want emergence of a new regional order led by Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Egypt, Israel, and uh, Jordan. As we've seen countless times, even in just the last few weeks, alliances are constantly shifting here in the Middle East. In the last month alone, we've seen several historic and rare peace talks, first between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, and then when the King of Jordan made his first visit to the Palestinian Authority in five years to form a new crisis committee. 
But Turkey and Iran may also see the advantage of teaming up because of the Kurdish referendum for independence, which is scheduled to vote in September, a vote that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has already lended his support for. Both Turkey and Iran have a sizable Kurdish minority population, and if the Kurds were to get their own state, it would mean a major shift in land for both nations, and give Israel a new ally in the region, as well as a much welcomed barrier against Iran. But as always, though the two countries may share a common interest, major differences will probably always stand in the way of true, lasting peace. Turkey is still very much unhappy with what Iran do broader, in the broader region, particularly from Yemen to Iraq to Syria. So it's very much a compartmentalized relationship. It is, as American says, uh, some kind of frenemy. I guess that's why you keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Here to help dive into the implications of an Iran-Turkey alliance is Dr. Martin Sherman, the founder and executive director of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. Thank you very much for joining me, uh, Dr. Sherman, again. Uh, so to begin, I want to ask you, you know, so apparently we're hearing that Israel, among other states, are going to uh, give their support for a Kurdish national homeland. Now, what, what would be the benefits to having a Kurdish state there uh, and why, you know, what else needs to happen for that to, for that to be accomplished? Well, I think clearly the, the Kurdish issue is the glue now that's bringing Iran and Turkey together. So one of the things that you'd have to have for such a state to be established is to somehow uh, reduce Iranian and Turkish uh, res uh, opposition to it. And I wouldn't hold my breath until that happens. But, but I think beyond that, what you're seeing with this so-called or seeming rapprochement between Iran and uh, Turkey is a, a dramatic illustration of the fickleness of international politics and the relationship between, uh, uh, between uh, uh, nations. Well, you know, it was, it was about 150 years ago, Lord Palmerston, the British uh, Foreign Secretary, described it as we have no, we have no eternal allies and no perpetual enemies. It's our interests that are eternal and perpetual, and those interests we have to follow. Well, what does that mean? That means you can never really count on any existing configuration of relationship between states, because a shift in conditions can shift interests and then shift alliances. And I think you know, what you're seeing now with Iran and, and, and Turkey is, is remarkable, because they've been uh, very hostile to each other even recently. Uh, they were, but they, they uh, uh, backed different sides in the Syrian uh, civil war. Uh, you have, uh, they're basically divided by the Sunni-Shiite divide. And all of a sudden, because of a particular uh, a prospect of a Kurdish state, they are forming an alliance, which in many so, ways is, is, is very ominous for Israel. So, uh, well, uh, not just ominous for Israel, I mean, considering that you have Iran making alliances with any of our regional neighbors, but with respect, uh, again, to the Kurdish state, if Iran and Turkey are coming together over this Kurdish issue, does it hurt the possibility of solving the Syrian civil war? Or is this diverting attention and, and well, energy? In, in certain aspects, of course, yes, because uh, you, you know the, one of the major forces fighting the, the at least one element in the in the Syrian war, ISIS, uh, are the Kurds. The Kurds have been a very effective force in 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 uh, dealing uh, with ISIS, and so suddenly now you would have. Turkey and Iran trying to neutralize the Turks, the the Kurds. I'm sorry. Uh, this sort of may exacerbate have, the ISIS issue. Yeah. Okay. So I, my final question, because unfortunately we're running out of time, but how would the Turkey uh, Iran alliance specifically affect the situation and Israel? And and what it seems to me though is that this would also kind of maybe open the door to more cooperation with Israel in the Gulf states and some of the other Arab states. Well, perhaps. But uh, you, you know, I think the 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 real worry is if the uh, Turkish and Iranian alliance gives Iran more freedom of movement in Syria, because mm -hmm. what you're seeing now is a gradual takeover of Syria by Iran, which I think has a very important message for Israel down the line, because you know, there, it wasn't long ago that people were talking about giving up the Golan. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine how disturbing it would be if you had given up the Golan and you had Iranian troops yeah. overlooking the Kinneret. So I, I, I think, in general, if this goes further uh, down the line and the cooperation between Turkey 
and uh, Iran uh, strengthens, uh, I think it's a very disturbing situation for Israel and an important lesson for Israel that you cannot take a current set of international relations as the basis for long-term strategic planning. Uh, well, I, uh, I hope that we know, that we figure out what we're going to do real soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin Sherman. Thank you. All right, now last month, President Trump pledged American support to help Lebanon fight the Islamic State. And now the Lebanese army, with help from the United States, is launching its biggest attack on ISIS to date. Here with us to explain the latest is ILTV's Brett Allen Smith. Brett, what's going on uh, on the ground there? Uh, thanks, Aaron. Well, Lebanon has been trying for years to clear out Islamic State fighters that seize control of a key area around Lebanon's border with Syria. That's, of course, just one front in a very complicated war. But we've just learned that the Lebanese army, backed with American training and support, is now trying to take back this region once and for all. And word has it that Lebanese soldiers received American military training for this and that top officials from the Pentagon were actually there in Lebanon lending support for this operation. All right, now since these ISIS troops are sort of straddling the border into Syria there, how is this going to affect all the other factions in the area? Well, politics, of course, often makes very strange bedfellows. Um, the Lebanese army is pushing against ISIS on one side of the border from the north, and then the Syrian army with Hezbollah are pushing against them, the same forces on the other side from the south. Now, the U.S. has, of course, denounced Hezbollah as a terror group, so neither Lebanon or Hezbollah are going to claim there's any kind of coordinated effort going on here. But considering Hezbollah holds, of course, major positions in the Lebanese parliament, it could be very easy for both armies to be working in parallel, as you'll see right now in the report. Last month, President Trump hosted Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri at the White House, pledging support to help Lebanon's army fight against the growing threat of the Islamic State. That would certainly seem to be the case now, as the Lebanese army begins its most massive push to date to drive out Islamic State fighters holding critical zones along the Syrian-Lebanese border. Backed with Pentagon intelligence and American training, this is Lebanon's single biggest military option against ISIS. And it comes at a time when the Islamic State is reported to control nearly 300 square kilometers in the region, armed with a surplus of lethal and cutting-edge weaponry. The Lebanese army is now aiming to finally rid ISIS troops from the area once and for all. But they're not alone, because on the other side of the border, fighting the same ISIS troops is the army of Hezbollah, backed by President Assad's Syrian army. Now on paper, this would be a clear two-front coordinated attack, but both sides are denying any collaboration is going on. That's because Lebanon's closest ally, the United States, has of course denounced Hezbollah as a terror organization, with President Trump personally calling out Syrian President Assad too. But for those who see Hezbollah as one of Lebanon's biggest allies, as well as a critical member of the Lebanese government, this seems like a clearly coordinated military effort. With Israel involved only in the periphery so far, who knows what this war could bring to the Israeli front. <laughs> Israel, like any country, has her fair share of musical icons, but it's not every day that your country produces an icon like Nahum Hyman. The late but great Nahum Hyman passed away on August 17th, just one year ago, at the age of 82, but that was after releasing 40 albums and composing over a thousand songs. Well, joining me now in the studio to tell us more on her father's incredible legacy is singer-songwriter C. Hyman and singer-songwriter and guitarist Elad Schudler. Thank you both uh, for joining me today you. Uh, at this time. Thank and you so for inviting us. It's my pleasure. Now, my first question, though, for you is, you know, what, what was your father like? Just mm. tell me a little bit about him. Well, he was, uh, like, um, very extreme in his uh, personality. He could be very childish on one hand and uh, very uh, serious on the other hand. Like, as, as a child, I was a little bit naughty. And from time to time, he would really raise his voice up and run after me in the mm -hmm. house, like really teaching me to be a mensch, to be polite, to be so and so. And on the other hand, he could take me for a walk and forget everything he did in the morning, like a father, and become like a little teenager, you know. A child at the playground. With very. He loved, he loved life. He was very colorful, very. So what, you know, what inspired his music? And, and are you inspired by similar things in your music? Hmm. I think my father passed a few um, inspirations during his life. He started off as telling the story of Israel. You can see mm -hmm. it in songs like, <clears throat> sorry, like Chofim, 
and Nitzanim Liru Ba'aretz from the, from the Bible and so many other songs that were saying how this country was built. Later on, things have moved on and we started the wars. And then he would um, express himself in songs like the Mirdaf and Hachol Izko about the soldiers that we lost, about the loss. And later, when the 70s came in, he became more personal. And then you would find him uh, attracted to, first of all, he, he would choose the texts so specifically because he, w he wouldn't talk so much about emotions, mm -hmm. but emotions through his songs um, reflected what he felt. And he was a woman lover, so he chose a lot of love songs, Anita Vechuan, Ilu Kolovim, so many others that reflected to love. Uh -huh. So, first of all, Elad, I wanted to ask you, you know, how did you get into the mix? Well, I met C two years ago, and we start working on songs, songs that I'm writing, a song that she's writing, and uh, we start performing and, and make uh, her father's songs, and we, we thought that it's good, <laughs> that it's when I'm good, so we, we started a show, wow. this show, that uh, contains a lot of songs of Nahum Iman and some songs of C from her career. And of El Ad's career, which makes it three yes, generations. And some, some songs that I'm writing for myself that came out from my albums. And it's, it's, that, that's what we got. We got three ge generations of music. Of, of music, you know. I'm the youngest and C yeah. above me and, of course, well, I know that. See, when you say that, yeah, you you said you also have your your son. That's uh, true. It's also a third generation, even younger than El Ad. But I'd like to say that my father, yeah. at one point of the of the show that El Ad was speaking about, which is called Songs and Stories from My Father's Home. Yeah, I know that this week today, uh, this week we have three upcoming shows. Right is uh, performing these songs of your own, your father's, and and El Ad's. Uh, and tell me a little bit about those. So, as we say, we are touring Israel from small to big. The first place we'll be on is this Thursday, mm -hmm. 24th of uh, August, yep. in a little cafe on Bnei Dror. It's called um, Cafe in the Village. And there mm -hmm. we go, just ourselves and giving it out, you know, the whole evening. And then on the 26th, which is Motzei Shabbat, Saturday mm -hmm. night, we're going to go with my son, hosting him in a nice place on the, on the on, not on the beach, it's Namal Tel Aviv, in the, it's in called Tokhaz. In Tel Aviv port. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there we're going to give also um, a few films that have not been seen that will be um, shown along the, the and evening. And kind of like detail your life. Yes, and, and his, in his life wow. and clips that we have done together and Incredible. songs that El Ad wrote and he wrote and everybody together. Mm -hmm. And then on the 28th, we're going back actually to the city that last was father's home, 18 last years of his life, which is quite a few years, he was living in Petah Tikva, and he was like chosen to be like the honorable um, citizen of Petah Tikva, and mm -hmm. Petah Tikva is uh, saluting to him mm -hmm. with a lot of singers, and Al-Ad is producing the show, so the whole creating, show. creating like this big, this big, big yeah. event. With that kind of introduction, I would like to waste no more time Thank and I'll, you so I'm much. let you sing that song. Thank you so much, and that's Thank on the you. 28th. Thank you very much. Alright, yeah, the 28th of August. Thank you. Thank you. אני ממשיך לראות, אני ממשיך לחלום את כל מה שהיה. כמו קיץ שנמוג על פני חלום של אור, כמו שיר של עונה אור. סתיו שלא עבר, כמו מחרוזות תפילה של שיר שלא נגמר. אני ממשיך לשיר, אני ממשיך לראות, אני ממשיך לחלום את כל מה שהיה. 
אני ממשיך לשיר, אני ממשיך לראות, אני ממשיך לחלום את כל מה שהיה. All right, now archaeologists have just made a huge discovery in the city of Vilna. They've just uncovered two sacred mikveh bathhouses used by Jews for hundreds of years, up until the Nazis destroyed Lithuania's great synagogue during the Holocaust. A major find for historians who have been trying to piece together the fractured story of Jewish life in Lithuania for years. Dr. John Seligman from the Israel Antiquities Authority made the discovery with the help of Lithuanian and American archaeologists uncovering not one but two mikvaot baths in the ruins of Vilna's great synagogue. I'm sitting here in the mikveh of one of the, uh, of the great synagogue of the city of Vilna, a city which once had, was once a community of 70,000 people. This is the second year we've been excavating in the bathhouse and in the mikveh of the great synagogue. And we have a very exciting find over here of the original mikveh of the Schulhof of the synagogue itself. This is the classic form of a mikveh, of a modern mikveh, yeah. with the tiling and the, the concrete steps. The person who would come here would first of all uh, would get undressed completely would come down the steps over here, where, where, where to go to the floor, and then would have to completely immerse themselves in the water. The water would have to completely cover them. So the height of this bath, as you can see today, is not the original height of the bath. The height of the bath originally would have been about yeah. this high. The Great Synagogue was built way back in the 17th century and was the center of Jewish life in Lithuania. Nearly half of the city of Vilna's population was Jewish up until the Nazis destroyed the Jewish community and razed the synagogue to the ground. But now it looks like archaeologists might finally be able to put more pieces of the puzzle together and discover centuries of lost Jewish heritage. This just in, my mom sent me cookies eight months ago and they never got here. I've spent the last year in white chocolate and macadamia nut purgatory, but now it looks like my anger may finally have a name. An employee of the Israeli Postal Service has just been caught red-handed, apparently stealing thousands of packages over the last year. The suspect behind thousands of undelivered packages, including Mama Porus's Choco Mahogany Bonanza cookies, allegedly worked as a post office at a post office in Rehovot as a cleaner, where he would steal packages before they were delivered to their rightful stomach. I, I mean destinations. A security officer caught the suspect in the act, and after police searched his home, discovered over a thousand undelivered packages that the suspect had apparently stolen over the course of a whole year. He's believed to have been selling the contents of the packages. Who knows how much he's made over the years? Or what chocolatey mahogany bonanza cookies go for on the black market these days. Police secured many stolen packages that had not yet been opened and intend to mail them to their intended destination. So if you've been waiting months for an undelivered package, don't give up hope just yet. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. Well, we just broke the news about an Israeli post office employee caught stealing hundreds of undelivered packages. So today, our word of the day is chavila, which is how you say package in Hebrew. Oh, the sheer joy you feel when you find that slip of paper in your mailbox that says, hey, you've got a chavila or a package. But what could it be? What's inside? What if the chavila is a big chavila? It could mean a new guitar or that new flat screen you ordered from Amazon. But a small chavila, well, that could be anything too. It could be a new watch or that book you told your parents to mail for you. Uh, but honestly, as long as your chavilot or packages are getting to your doorstep, who cares? I'll take it. The weather is brought to you by international singer-songwriter Sabina. Make sure to check out her latest album, Purple Ribbons, and get updated for upcoming concerts. Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow should be more of the same, but with a slight drop in temperatures to a high of 88 or 31 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.61 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I am Aaron Porras, and thanks for watching.